Yes, this is going to be your fundamentals of nursing chapter one, which is evolution of nursing thought and action. We are not going to do the critical thinking and nursing process. I'll have that on another um, video because this is going to be um, quite a lot of information. So if you're already in the medical field, a lot of this information you're already going to be familiar with. But if you're not familiar with anything to do with the world of medicine and nursing and healthcare, then a lot of this information is going to be new. So I'm going over everything that your FA Davis book has to offer. So again, chapter one, evolution of nursing, thought and action. So your book starts out with images of nursing throughout the decades. And they start with all of these um, commonly seen images. So we have the nurse that's seen as the angel of mercy. And this image grew out of the influence of religion and um, the risks inherent to the practice of nursing. Images of the angel nurse are usually serene and content. She's gonna have a halo or other religious symbols symbols. And then we have the battle axe nurse. So um, that image of the nurse is a battle axe emerged as science and physiology grew popular during the 17th century when religious orders became less common. A more recent historical example is found in that 1975 film, One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, with the nurse Ratchet, who is this image right here. So Nurse Ratchet personified the nurse as a battle axe or a torturer, treating her patients with cruelty and disdain. Going on through history, um, we have the professional. So that would be um, from Florence Nightingale, who kept meticulous notes and statistics that were used for advocating and obtaining changes in health care. She used her political connections and social standing to return nursing to a respectable profession. The Nightingale School for Nurses was opened in 1960 and is considered the first um, official nursing program. And we'll talk about Florence more when we get into evidence-based practice and a lot of other topics she comes up with. So then we have the military. So this would be um, the 1900s. Nurses were frequently portrayed in uniforms providing support at the battlefield. Nurses are still often characterized as warriors fighting for disease. The impact of wars has always had a positive influence on the development of nursing as a profession. Nurses took the lead in providing care to sick, wounded, and dying soldiers in each of the following wars, which would be the American Civil War, Spanish War, World War I and II, Vietnam, Korean, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. Uh, and even with our recent COVID pandemic, um, I'm sure many of you were on social media and you would see all those different images of nurses in their masks or nurses after wearing their masks having those um, indentations on their nose and things like that. Then we have our handmaiden. So this is a stereotypical portrayal that the male is gonna be the physician in the dominant role with the female nurse merely assisting the doctors. Um, this image grew out of the nurse's early limited role in healing from the legal and financial authority of the physician and from the nurse's work position as an employee. And in a few more slides, we're going to talk about um, that nurse's position as an employee and whether we're just a profession or whatnot. So then the final one that we're going to talk about is the full spectrum, which is what nursing today is, right? We're highly trained, we're well-educated, we're caring and we're competent professionals. Um, we're all essential members of the healthcare team. Um, the complexity of healthcare delivery requires that nurses use critical thinking, communication, organizational skills, leadership. They need to advocate for not just the patient, but for themselves. And they need to have technical skills to ensure that their patients receive safe and effective care. So 
So throughout all of my slides, I usually always have where there's going to be a question and then the next slide will give you the answer. Um, if you want to read through these on your own and guess, pause, read, guess, whatnot, that's fine. Um, when I get to them, I'm just going to continue to kind of breeze past them. So in each of the images of nurses throughout history, how does caring remain? Right, and then this would be a discussion slide that we would sit in class and we would talk about, you know, maybe the angel of mercy, the image grew out of influence of religion and the risk of inherent to practice of nursing. Um, images of that angel nurse are usually serene. Um, it's just kind of to reinforce what we already have discussed in that first slide. So again, some of the slides I'm gonna kind of go through rapidly just so that the online content is not too overwhelming. So safe and effective nursing care is kind of the mantra that comes through the F.A. Davis book. And safe, effective nursing caring is their thinking, caring, and doing. And then we have our IOM core competencies. And we can see how the IOM core competencies directly align with the F.A. Davis safe, effective nursing care, which is that thinking, caring, and doing. So IOM's number one is to provide the client-centered care, and F.A. Davis wants us to provide goal-directed client care. Um, and that's how they're gonna teach you, right? That's how our book's gonna read through. So working interprofessional teams, you're gonna be noting things in the book that talk about collaborating with interprofessional healthcare teams. Um, IOM wants us to employ evidence-based practice, and your book's going to talk about validating evidence by research to incorporate it into your patient practice. Uh, I then want you to use quality improvement. And then the F.A. Davis talks about provide safe quality care. And the final one is the utilization informatics. And this is going to be embrace, incorporate technology and advances. So the book very much um, overlaps with the IOM and, and their core competencies. So safe and effective nursing care, again, this would be more of a topic of discussion that we would have in class and interact together. And then we're going to move into nursing today. So nurses today, as I said before, they need to be competent and caring professionals, and they're going to have that complexity of critical thinking, which critical thinking is a chapter all on its own, communication, which is a chapter all on its own, organization, as a student nurse, you need to be extremely organized, and you're going to find that if you're not organized, um, nursing school is going to be very difficult. You need to balance multiple classes. You need to balance, you know, fundamentals. We have fundamentals. We have fundamentals labs, and you have fundamentals clinical. At the same time as you're taking fundamentals, you have pharmacology. So there's a lot going on, and you need to make sure that you stay organized so that you don't miss any deadlines um, with your assignments, whether they be in lab or class. Leadership, leadership is going to be in chapter all of its own. Advocacy for your patients is spread throughout the semester. Um, technical skills, we're going to talk about some technical skills while we're in class. And then you're going to be doing some technical skills in fundamentals labs. Now, remember, you're also going to have labs in med surge, um, a few of your med surge courses. So we don't do IVs, blood draws. Uh, advanced respiratory stuff, all of that saved until later. Uh, but we're going to get through a lot of skills this semester. Now, prior to completing your skills in lab, if you go to clinical and you haven't been checked off in lab, you're not allowed to do your skills. So just remember that. Um, and I think that would be for almost any nursing program. So the roles and function of the nurse, right? Now, if you have a family member who's a nurse, they'll probably go through these very rapidly. And a lot of these, we don't even realize that we're doing when we do that. So the first one's probably the easiest. It's the direct patient care provider. And this is gonna be addressing the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of your client. So this is listening to lung sounds, giving medications, patient teaching, things like that. 
then there's the nurse who's the communicator. So she's going to be using her interprofessional and therapeutic communication skills to address the needs of the client, to facilitate communication in the healthcare team, and to advise the community about health promotion and disease prevention. So all of these examples, right? We have the client. So who's the client? The client can be a patient, right? So those, those terms are interchangeable. Um, if you're a community-based nurse, you're going to be doing that community health promotion. Um, if you're a nurse manager, you might not be doing direct patient care, but you might have to communicate with your team of nurses. Um, if you're a direct patient care, your patient might have a health care team. So when we look at examples of that communicator, it can be counseling a patient directly. It can be discussing staffing needs on a unit. Um, it could be providing HIV education. And then we fall into educators. So all nurses need to be educators. Some of us are going to be educators in that more formal role, like being a nursing professor. Um, but each of you who's going to take care of a patient needs to be an educator. You're going to be educating your clients. You might be doing family education, community education, or group education. Once the diagnosis is made, um, the nurse needs to plan how to meet the needs of the patient. And you need to implement the teaching so that they understand. And then you need to evaluate the teaching's effectiveness. So examples of this could be preoperative teaching, um, prenatal education, or community classes on nutrition. We are all advocates, right? We want to support our clients' right to make their own healthcare decisions when they're able to voice their opinions and to make sure that we protect them from harm when they're unable to make their decisions. Sometimes we need to help a client explain to their family why they no longer want to continue with certain treatments such as chemotherapy or radiation. We also are counselors, so we're going to use our therapeutic communication skills that were learned to advise our clients about healthcare-related issues. So we could be counseling a patient on weight loss strategies or smoking, uh, things of that nature. So then as a change agent. So we're going to find out in a few more lectures how change is difficult and nurses are sometimes resistant to change. But we need to advocate for change on an individual, family group, community, or even societal level that will enhance health care. When we start talking about our evidence-based practice and our evidence-based nursing, we want to use the most current and up-to-date evidence so that our patients are having optimal health care outcomes. So the nurse may use counseling, communication, and educator skills to accomplish this change. Um, we want to work to improve our quality of patient care. Um, an example might be changing um, a timeout call. If you work in the OR and you have several patients that have had uh, wrong limbs, wrong sites, and you're not doing an appropriate timeout, you know, that's a big thing that you would think nobody would be that negligent on. But it happens, right? We hear in the news all the time that somebody had the wrong extremity cut off or somebody was operated on the wrong body part, right? So the, um, all the nursing boards and whatnot have come together in the perioperative worlds and they've made these changes on timeouts and what they should include and what they should not include. But if that's not implemented in your hospital, then you can still have these issues. So change agent is really um, important. And next we have our leader. So all nurses need to be leader, right? Not all the nurses need to be managers, but all nurses need to be leaders. We need to be able to inspire others by setting a good positive example. Um, and that positivity needs to be on health. We need to have good communication and we need to always have that willingness to improve. Some of your biggest inspiring nurses would be Florence Nightingale. She saw that that um, clean environment had good patient outcomes, whereas that dirty environment caused an infection and then caused patients to have poor outcomes. 
So definitely a very inspiring person. Manager, right? So there's different types of managers. We can have our unit manager and, and you know, that would be um, a roller function, but we also need to be able to manage our different patients. So we need to coordinate and manage the activities. So you might need to coordinate and manage the activities of just your patient assignment, but if you're actually like a unit manager, then you're gonna need to coordinate and manage the activities of all the team members, which would be um, doing patient assignments, maybe scheduling staff, um, handling interdisciplinary actions and things of that nature. ACE managers are very specific to patient care. They're going to coordinate the care delivered to the patient. Um, this is going to be bringing in multiple services. So say we have a patient who had a recent hip fracture and they're going to be going to rehab and now they're getting ready to go home from rehab. They still need physical therapy. They still need occupational therapy. Maybe they need some wound care. So that case manager at the nursing home is going to help align that the patient's going to have continued follow-up care within all those specialties. And the final one that we have is the research consumer. So the research consumer is going to be the nurse that applies the evidence-based practice to provide the most appropriate care to identify clinical problems that warrant research and to protect the rights of research subjects. So reading journal articles is a great example of this, right? If we read the articles, we're learning the most up-to-date stuff. If we attend continuing education or we're continue to seek additional education, we'll always stay current on what's going on. And it's very important to stay current on what's going on, um, no matter what role of nursing you are. So our thinking skills. Right. Clinical judgment. Clinical judgment is something that takes, well, all of these take a lot of time um, to get to the point where you're confident to doing them. Problem solving is sometimes easier because if most of us have to problem solve other things in our life, um, problem solving is going to be a process by which the nurse considers an issue and attempt to find a satisfactory solution to achieve the best outcome. Um, this is gonna be probably your most often issue that you deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Critical thinking is a huge buzz topic. Um, it's gonna be throughout your nursing school career. It's gonna bleed into your first several years um, of your nursing practice because it's gonna take probably about one to two years of professional practice before you're using critical thinking and reflective thinking without even recognizing it. Um, this is going to be that reflective thinking process that involves collecting information, analyzing the um, adequacy and accuracy of the information, and carefully considering options for action. Nurses use their critical thinking in every aspect of their nursing career. And we're going to talk about that more in the next lecture because that's chapter two in your book. And then back onto clinical judgment, right? Clinical judgment involves observing, comparing, contrasting, and evaluation the client's condition to determine whether change has occurred. It also involves careful consideration of the client's health status in light of what is expected based on the client's conditions, medications, and treatments, right? So a great example of that would be you have a patient with a fever. If a patient has a fever, they're going to be tachycardic. So if your patient has a heart rate of 130 and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? We wouldn't necessarily call right everybody's attention to that because we know that the patient's afebrile or the patient is febrile. And if you're febrile, you're gonna have tachycardia. Now, if you give your patient Tylenol and it, the fever is reduced and your patient is now afebrile and they don't have a fever and they're still tachycardic, well, then that could be a concern because maybe they're dehydrated from having the fever. And again, don't think that you're all supposed to know this, right? This is things that we're gonna learn as we go along, but it's just an example of how to use critical thinking and clinical judgment um, together. Right. 
So nursing, the American Nurses Association um, in the 1980s had a very basic definition. And they said that it's the diagnosis, treatment of the human response to actual and potential health problems. And then in 2010, they revamped it. And they said that the nursing practice is individualized. Nurses care by establishing partnership, caring essential to the patient practice of the RN. RNs use nursing process to plan and provide individualized care to healthcare consumers. A strong link between the professional and the work environment and the RN's ability to provide quality health care and achieve optimal health outcomes. That was kind of an odd one. And then in 2015, this is the most recent one, and I have this on the next page. So nursing is protection, promotion, and optimization of health and abilities, prevention of illness and injuries, facilitation of healing, alleviation of suffering, through the diagnosis and treatment of human response and advocacy and caring for individuals, families, groups, communities, and populations. And that is a really great definition of what nursing is. Wow. Nursing always needs to be individualized, right? We don't, get, we don't provide medical care in one size fits all. We always need partnerships, right? Nursing always uses interprofessional collaboration. Um, not to mention, you also need to establish some type of partnership or rapport with your patient. Uh, nursing is patient-centered. Caring is central to your practice, okay? Um, you need to maintain your professional work environment, quality health care and optimal outcomes, all of that, really super important. All right, so why is defining nursing important, all right? Because it helps the public understand the value of nursing and it helps differentiate the activities of the nurse from those other that practice in medicine. And it also helps you understand what is expected. So important qualities for a nurse to have, look at that critical thinking skills, number one, right? Um, and then we just kind of progress down these. So um, to give you some examples of these, so an example of critical thinking would be, you know, you call the provider to get a stronger pain medication for a patient who two hours after receiving the pain medication is still having severe pain. We wouldn't just say, okay, well, sorry, you're in pain. I gave you it, but it didn't work. No, we want to critically think and, and try to help them out. Um, caring and compassion can be as simple as sitting and holding the hand of a client who's just been told that they have a terminal illness. Detail-oriented person is going to be somebody who seeks clarification and correction of a dose of medication that might be written incorrectly. Um, when you start getting into your med, med math calculations, um, you're going to learn about trailing zeros and um, leading zeros and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, depending on if you have a decimal point or not. Organizational skills, right? We wanna make sure that we prioritize and we meet the needs of the most critical patients first. Um, and a lot of times students get tricked up on what's, what prioritization means. And just because you have a stat order doesn't take precedence over somebody who doesn't have their airway painted, right? So if my airway, I can't get any air in, then I'm gonna die, right? And a stat medication might be a Ducalox for somebody who needs to have a bowel movement to be discharged. So what's more important, right? Um, and again, we'll learn more about that as you know the semesters roll on. Speaking skills, right? We need to make sure that we communicate correct and pertinent information to both the clients and members of the healthcare team. So you wanna make sure that when you're getting a message that you clarify that you received it correctly, whether that's taking orders from a physician or even a patient's complaint, um, working many years in the emergency room and doing triage, 
I'll have patients come in and they will give me a battery of complaints. And I just have to narrow it down to what was the straw that broke the camel's back that made you come in tonight, right? Because of things that have been going on for two, three, four months, you've been tolerating and living with, something had to change to make you come in tonight. So speaking skills, very important. Same as listening skills, right? So um, we need to make sure that we listen to our clients' concerns. And again, you know, if you're taking those telephone orders, you need to make sure that they're appropriate. Patience, what do they say? Patience is a virtue. Um, in our stressful situations in work, environment, we need to make sure that we're patient. We need to make sure that we're thinking clearly. We want to make sure that we're taking correct actions. So we need to remain calm when we're with a client whose condition is deteriorating. We need to make sure that we continue to provide them care and transfer the client to um, the services that they need to. So if you're somebody who's not good in a stressful situation, um, you know, the ICU might not be the best location for you. The ER might not be the best location for you. Med surge might be great. Um, the OR might be great. Competence. So knowledge and skills to ensure safe quality care um, client outcomes. And we'll talk about competencies a little bit more when we get into um, Benner's um, theory. Our emotional stability. So we need, if you do not already have good coping mechanisms, you definitely want to try to develop some good coping mechanisms. Nursing is extremely stressful and nurses that do not cope well usually burn out very rapidly. So um, alcohol is not a good coping mechanism, um, but there's plenty of things. Maybe you like to take walks, maybe you like to paint, maybe you like to fish. You need to find your ways to cope. Um, and there's different types of coping, like how are you gonna cope in the midst of an emergency crisis? Um, and how are you gonna cope if you had a really rough night at work? And then physical stamina, right? Nursing is physically demanding. You can be assigned a patient that is 300 plus pounds for a 12 hour work shift, but you need to lift up in bed every two hours and turn in bed every two hours. So remember, it's gonna be long hours of standing, long hours of walking, a lot of pushing and pulling. Um, when we get into lab, when we start to talk, start to talk about um, safe body mechanics, it's really important that you uh, pay attention and implement those. So then your book goes into, is nursing a profession, a discipline, or an occupation? Uh, and for the most part, nursing comes into really all of these, right? A case can be made that nursing is both a profession and a discipline. It's scientifically based and self-governed, so that's profession. Um, and it focuses on the ethical care of others. It's also a discipline because it's driven by aspects of theory and practice. Uh, it demands mastery of both theoretical knowledge and clinical skills. It's also considered an occupation. Uh, and the reason for this is because most physicians are in control of the practice environment, the working condition, and the schedule. Um, many nurses are hourly wage earners. The employer, not the nurse, decides the conditions of the work practice and the nature of the work. So your book's key point behind that is rather than continuing to develop an argument to prove that nursing is a profession, um, we as nurses should do actions to improve the status of nursing such as standardizing educational requirements for entry into practice. And that's focusing on, you know, you have your diploma nurses, you have your associate degree nurses, and you have your baccalaureate nurses that all have different levels of education, but all sit for the same nursing NCLEX board. Um, they also suggest in, um, uniform continuing education requirements. Um, your continuing education requirements are state-based, not nationally-based. 
they want to encourage the participation of nurses in professional organizations. So all of you have the opportunity right now to join the Student Nurses Association, which would be a professional organization. Um, and then once you get to practice, you can join the AMA, or if you go into a specialty like the emergency room, you can do the Emergency Nurses Association. And we'll talk about those more in the next few slides. Um, and then we want to educate the public about the true nature of nursing practice. So, um, how can we, oh, this is just everything that I talked about. So how can we as nurses improve our recognition, right? So the education, the um, education to practice, the education continuing our organizations and then public. So lots of education there. So how do nurses get their education? So all of you here right now are in an associate's degree program. If you were in a diploma program, it would be a three-year hospital-based. So these nurses have a lot more clinical experience and are typically stronger when they start out. These nurses need to pass their diploma program which would need to be a, what's the word I'm thinking of? An accredited program and then sit for the end class. All of you in this program are in an associate's degree program. So we say that it's a two year program in a community college. We know that it takes more than two years because most of you complete your prerequisites or your sciences prior to getting into the program. We just passed our accreditation, so that's good. And then after you pass our program, then you're gonna sit for your state boards. Same thing with the bachelor's degree. That baccalaureate nurse, they're gonna have eight semesters of college. It's gonna be university-based, needs to be accredited. And once they pass, they have to sit for the NCLEX. If you go into the master's program, that's where you're going to have a different board. So all three of these programs, whether you have three years, two years, or four years, you're all going to sit for the end class. Now, I'm going to say, a lot of times students say, well, just tell us what's on the test. Tell me what's on the test, right? But all of this is to prepare you to be able to take the end class. So we don't know what's on the NCLEX. We can't prepare you anything more than teaching you what we need to teach you. So um, just, so our continuing education. All of you should consider continuing your education once you've completed with this program. Um, you can do a bachelor's degree online and it will enhance your job security and it would make you more marketable. Other continuing education, like I said before, um, each state mandates what nurses need to do for their continuing education to renew their licensure. So you need to be aware of whatever state that you're in. Tennessee is a compact state. So if you apply for your Tennessee license and then you apply for a compact license, you're licensed to practice in several states. Um, our continuing education here is much different than continuing education in other states. So for somebody who's looking to travel, you're looking at going out to California where they have this huge um, travel nursing incentives, you just need to be aware of what that state's education is. So entry into practice, again, we have our diploma, we have our associate's degree, we have our BSN. Those are all your entry into bedside nursing. They're all gonna sit for the NCLEX. RN to BSN is gonna be that program that once you get your RN, you can do your BSN, whether it be online or in a traditional program. Your master's degree, so you can have master's in nursing education, which is what I have you can have a mastering into a practitioner program. You can do a mastering into leadership. They have mastering informatics. Or you could do a doctoral program. 
some nurses go from BSN to DMP. Um, and our next slide talks a little bit more about the DMPs. So I have the DMP in nursing practice. Um, that's typically more of a leadership type of thing. You can have a doctoral in nursing research or you can have a doctoral in nursing philosophy. Some other forms of education. Um, again, we have our continuing education. Continuing education is your state board of nursing. Um, and you might have in service through whatever healthcare system you work for. Some healthcare systems in service education is equivalent to getting continuing education for your licensure. But not all hospitals do that. For a hospital to have continuing education that counts towards your licensure, they have to apply for that particular program to count. So with that, you need to be aware because um, every hospital has tons of annual things that you have to do. Uh, some of them are just, you know, your nosocomial hospital acquired infections. Some of them are unit specific type things. Um, fall prevention is a big one that they do every year. But those in services do not always, as I said, count for your in for your biannual continuing education for your licensure. So now we're going to move on to Benner. So Benner's theory of um, novice to expert is a very commonly spoken nursing theorist. Um, so basically, the novice nurse has little nursing experience. This is going to be the first stage of actually acquiring knowledge related to this field. And all of you would be considered in this novice nurse role. Stage two is the new graduate, all right? So once you guys are done, you should be at this advanced beginner. And this is when you're gonna be able to focus more on aspects of clinical situation. You're gonna be using more facts and you're gonna be making, um, making more sophisticated use of rules and recognizing similarities in situations. You're going to be able to distinguish abnormal findings, um, but you're not always going to be able to readily understand the significance of it. And then we have competency, right? We talked about competency a few slides back. And it usually takes about two to three years for a nurse in the same practice area to become truly competent in that area and gain additional experience and be able to handle those more complex concerns. Uh, they're going to be able to handle a patient load, um, prioritize situations. You're going to be involved in more caregiving role. You're going to be um, emotionally involved in your clinical choices that you make. Now, to be completely honest, at this point, most hospitals want nurses to come out of nursing school as competent. Uh, the timeline to get you two to three years to get up to snuff um, is less, I don't know if I want to say tolerated, but it used to be you would graduate and you would have, you know, a year of orientation. Um, and then, you know, after about another year of practicing on your own, you were confident. Now we're having, you know, two month orientations uh, and they expect you to get there. So that means we in this nursing school are trying to get you, you know, past that advanced beginner before you graduate, which is why there's so many clinical documents we have you do um, and why we try to get you as immersed into stuff as we can. Same thing with case studies, right? The more we do case studies, um, you'll do those more in med surge than in fundamentals, but the more you do them, if you really immerse yourself in them, it's like you've lived through those clinical experiences, and then you can continue to draw on them when you get to a professional practice. The next is stage four. So stage four is going to be the proficient nurse. She's going to be able to quickly take all aspects of the situation and immediately give meaning to these cluster of assessment data. Um, they're going to be a resource for the less experienced nurses. 
um, proficient nurses are able to see the big picture and they can coordinate services and forecast needs, um, whether it's needs of patient or needs of the you. The final one is the expert nurse. So not every nurse who practices, whether she practices for one year or 50 years, is going to get to that expert nurse level. The expert nurse is gonna use intuition while she's operating with a deep understanding of the situation, often recognizing a problem in the absence of clinical signs and symptoms. They're gonna have expert skills and are often consulted when others need advice or assistance. They're typically gonna fill roles as a resource nurse or a nurse educator. So our regulation of nursing practice, who regulates us? So we're regulated on many ways. So we have our Nurse Practice Act, and this in the United States, each state enacts its own Nurse Practice Acts. So these are going to be laws that regulate nursing practice. The State Board of Nursing is an agency responsible for regulating nurse practice. They are charged with protecting the health, safety, and welfare of our general public. And then we have our State Board of Nursing. So each board of nursing is responsible for approving nursing education programs, defining the practice of professionalism in nursing, establishing criteria that allow a person to be licensed as a registered nurse or licensed as um, a vocational nurse. They're defining professional practice, which determines the nurse's scope of practice or those activities that nurses are expected to perform, developing rules and regulations for guidance to nurses, and they're gonna be enforcing the rules that govern nursing. So if you do not graduate from an accredited school, right, then you're not gonna be able to sit for your state board of nursing or licensure. So licenses are issued by the state all states require graduate from an approved nursing program and successful completion of your National Council licensure exam, which is your NCLEX. To receive licensure in another state, the nurse simply applies for the licensure by endorsement. Um, sometimes that's also called reciprocity. Or they follow the guidance of mutual recognition model, which I've never had to do that. I've done reciprocity and I've done endorsement. Um, reciprocity is usually you just get to walk in and get it. Um, last I was aware South Carolina did reciprocity and then endorsement was how I got my license from New Jersey to Tennessee. Professional standards, we're going to talk about this more on the next slide, but they're um, authoritative statements and duties that all registered nurses, regardless of the role, population, or specialty, are expected to perform. And these are by the ANA, which is the American Nurses Association. Standards provide a guide to the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that nurses must incorporate into their practice to provide safe, quality care. Standards are used by individual nurses, employers of nurses, professional organizations, and other professionals. So we have our scope and standards of practice as a nursing student. So as a nursing student, you're gonna use the ANA standards to better define your nursing practice. And you can find that on page 14 in your textbook. Our practicing nurses use the standards to judge their own performance, develop an improvement plan, and understand employer expectations. Employers may incorporate the standards into the annual employee evaluation tools, and professional organizations use the standards to educate the public about nursing, to plan for continuing education programs, and to guide their lobbying, lobbying efforts. Um, and other advocacy activities. And our nursing program, all of your nursing program outcomes, which can be found in your handbook, all align directly with the nursing, the American Nursing Association scope and standards of clinical practice, as do the um, outcomes of this course.
So moving on, we're going to talk about some professional organizations in the next two slides. So the first one is the American Nurses Association, right? This is the professional organization for nurses in the United States. Originally, the ANA focused on establishing standards of nursing to promote high quality care and to work towards licensure as a means of ensuring adherence to um, the standards. The ANA continues to update its standards. Representatives are elected from local branches of the state organization to bring their concepts to national level. As such, they track healthcare legislations, serve as liaisons with the government representatives to inform them how to current and proposed legislative will affect nursing. They also develop and sponsor legislation that will have a positive effect on nursing and patient care. The ANA publishes, um, publishes educational materials on nursing news, issues, and standards. Then we have our National League of Nursing, which is your NLN. These set up standards for all types of nursing education programs, um, studies the nursing workforce, lobbies and participates with other major healthcare organizations to set policy for nursing workforce, they aid faculty development, they fund research for nursing education, and publishes the journal, which is the Nursing Education Perspectives. And then we have our International Council of Nursing. This aims to ensure quality nursing care for all supports, global health policies, and advances nursing and improves worldwide health, and strives to improve working condition for nurses throughout the world. The next slide, we're going to talk about the National Student Nurses Association. Um, this is something that you guys are all eligible to join. Um, it's the student counterpart of the ANA. Like the ANA, this association comprises of elected volunteers who advocate on behalf of student nurses. Um, it sponsors yearly um, conventions to address the concerns of student nurses. There's local chapters that are organized in individual schools, and it publishes um, image, a journal dedicated to nursing students. Sigma Theta U is a international honor society for nurses. Memberships include the clinical education and nursing research communities and senior level baccalaureate and graduate programs. The goal of this organization is to foster nursing scholarship, leadership, service, and research to improve healthcare worldwide. They publish the Journal of Nursing Scholarship. And then we have specialties. So specialties is vast. Um, essentially every single topic that we talk about in fundamentals has the potential to have a specialty, a clinical specialty area behind it. So, um, you know, when we go into our operative stuff, we have the um, association of operative nursing. Um, you can have disease specific, so association of nursing and AIDS care, or you can have emergency nurses, which is the um, ENA, or you can have critical care, which is um, CCRN. So you know, there's tons of clinical specialty. And if you really enjoy a clinical specialty, then you would want to join that specialties um, group and even potentially sit for that licensure. So I have, um, I'm part of the ENA, the Emergency Nurses Certification, and I have my national certification for emergency nursing, so I have my CEN. I mean, it's just another way to stay up to date on current information. So recipients of nursing care, right? We have our individuals, which would be our patients. We can have groups. So if you work um, in like a school system, you might be providing healthcare to a group of second graders or K through six. Families, 
Um, sometimes nurses do family counseling. Some nurses just provide that holistic care to the patient. And with that holistic care, you're also caring for the families. Or you might be a public health nurse doing community outreach stuff. So remember, we have, sometimes they're called patients, sometimes they're called clients, sometimes they're called persons. It's all the same thing. Don't get hung up on terms. If you're reading a question and you see client, um, it's not that equity is trying to trick you. A client is a patient, is a person. Um, we can provide care to any of those terms. Uh, the more specific thing is what kind of care are we providing? So are we providing direct care or are we providing indirect care? Direct care is gonna involve a personal interaction between the nurse and the patient, um, such as giving medication or teaching. And then indirect care is gonna be working on behalf of the client to improve their health status. So maybe you're ordering unit supplies or you're serving on an ethics um, committee. Um, a nurse may use independent judgment to determine the care needed or they may work under the direct order of a primary care provider. As a nurse, we should be able to view our client as an active recipient of care. Um, your book has that key point. Your role is to encourage clients to actively participate in decisions about their care and to collaborate with members of the healthcare team. So your purpose of nursing care, right? Why are we doing this? We wanna do good health promotion, we want to do illness prevention, health restoration, and definitely um, end of life care. So we need to collaborate with interprofessional health care team. We need to ensure that we're holistically caring for them. We want to make sure that your care is individualized to your patient's needs. And we want to plan the patient care to ensure that we have consistency of care over um, a time period. So our different types of model of care. Um, some of these you're gonna see in your clinical experiences. Some of them you might not see um, ever in your career. So the first is case method. Um, this is also called total care. It's gonna be one-to-one -one care. One nurse provides all the aspects of the care for one patient during a single shift. An inpatient may have different nurses each shift. Um, although this method may be satisfying for patients and nurses, it's highly, um, it's a fine, it's costly. Um, and in times where we're having these nursing shortages, it's different, um, difficult to achieve. Um, examples of where you might see this would be an intensive care unit, um, labor and delivery, or if you're doing private duty care. The next is functional nursing. So this is gonna be care that's compartmentalized for each task assigned to a staff member with the appropriate knowledge and skills. This approach requires a clear understanding of what tasks are required to deliver care in each unit. Although this approach is economic and efficient, when we have short staffing, it can easily lead to fragmentation of care, meaning that it's difficult for the nurse to have the whole picture of a patient. So if I'm the nurse that's just giving meds and somebody else is just the nurse that's doing blood work and somebody else is just doing the head to toe assessment, well, if the head to toe assessment person doesn't tell me perhaps that the vital signs are wrong or you know the heart rate's abnormal, and I just go and give the medication, that could be dangerous, right? So um, I've never worked in a location that does that style of nursing. Team nursing is an efficient arrangement for delivering nursing care that maintains the cost savings of function. Um, nursing while attempting to limit fragmentation. So in a team nursing licensed practitioner nurse is paired with a nursing assistant. Um, so you're gonna have you know, your RN, your LPN, and maybe the nurse's aide all on one team. And the team is assigned to a group of patients the nurse is going to act as the team lead. She's going to be taking those higher acuity patients, but she can do the tasks that the LPN can't. Um, so it functions really nicely. Um, 
a few years ago, hospitals took all your LPNs out of the hospital setting, but due to our nursing shortages, we're seeing more and more LPNs come back into the hospitals. With that, um, I know Park West uses team nursing for that. So if any of you go to Park West, you might partake in that style of nursing. Primary nursing is one nurse manages care for a group of patients. The primary nurse um, assesses when the patient um, assesses the patient and develops a plan of care. When she is at work, she provides care for the patients for whom she is responsible. In her absence, um, an associate nurse delivers the care and implements the plan of care that the primary care nurse um, developed. So most hospitals do primary nursing. Uh, that's going to be your more traditional. And then we have differentiated practice. So this is going to be a variation of primary nursing that recognizes that education and experience lead to differences in care delivered by nurses. For the system to work, each unit must identify the type of expertise needed by the patients and the nursing competencies required to deliver that care. Once this has been developed, individual nurses put together a portfolio to demonstrate their competencies. Nurses who have the necessary competencies care for those patients. Um, I see this very often in your chemotherapy floors. Um, a lot of times your cancer units are not solely cancer units. Um, at Children's, we have two E's, which the eyes on the oncology floor. Um, and the oncology nurses will take those patients who need whatever type of chemos they're getting for the day. They might also take some general medicine kits. We usually try to do like clean kids in. So if you have that competency where you're licensed and able to give chemo, you have that specialty that you would be in your portfolio that somebody who's not licensed to give chemo could do. Hopefully that works. So our different types of healthcare delivery systems. Again, if you're already out in the healthcare world, you might know all of these inside and out. But if you've never even been inside a hospital, then some of these might be a little fuzzy for you. So hospitals are going to be your most expensive and most frequently used site for care. They're going to provide a broad range of services to treat various injuries and disease process services. Basic services will include inpatient beds, radiology, laboratory. Hospitals usually have emergency departments, diagnostic areas, um, and then they'll have various units. So it could be med surge, um, it could just be general medical, it could be just general surgical, it could have pediatrics, they could have intensive care units, um, even maternal or newborn units. Extended care facilities provide care for clients from an extended period of time, usually for longer than a month. Um, as the length of stay in the hospital has declined, extended care facilities have begun to deliver services that were previously provided in the hospital. These facilities include your nursing homes, your skilled nursing facilities, also known as convalescent hospitals, and rehabilitation facilities. Um, the distinction among them is based primarily on whether they provide skilled or custodial care. We have ambulatory care centers, and these are used by people to get same-day cost-effective health care. Ambulatory care is synonymous with outpatient care and provides services for clients who are able to come, come and go from the facility. So a client lives at home or in a non-hospital setting, they're going to come in. Um, a good example of ambulatory care centers are surgery centers, right? You're going to you know, prep for your colonoscopy at home, and then you're going to come in, and they're going to do your scope, and then they're going to discharge you. We have healthcare agencies. Healthcare agencies provide continuing care to patients after hospitalizations. Home care is provided when clients are homebound or unable to get to the ambulatory care center for services, or the client slash family prefers to receive care at home, particularly when the patient is terminally ill. Or we could have a client still require skilled care that's discharged from the hospital because their reimbursement length of stay has expired. 
Then we have rehabilitation centers. So rehabilitation centers fall into two buckets. It could be for physical rehabilitation, so a joint replacement, um, a long stay in the hospital where they just need to get working on their muscles, or it could be for um, mental illness, drug um, addiction, alcohol addiction. So if you have a patient that says, you know, they were in rehab, you need to specify, you know, what type of rehabilitation was it. Um, rehab services can be inpatient, they can be outpatient, or they can be a combination. Your assisted living facilities are designed to bridge the gap between independence and institutionalized for our older adults who have declined in health status and cannot live alone independently. Residents of these facilities are going to be able to perform self-care activities, but they're going to require assistance with maybe meal preparation, housekeeping, medication. So we can have acute care, and acute care is going to be services used to treat active, sudden, often unexpected, urgent, or emergency episodes of injuries or illnesses that can lead to death or disability without having that rapid intervention. Or we can have long-term support services. These are in contrast. Um, we're going to have that human assistance, assistive technologies and devices, environmental modifications, care and services and coordination on a regular or intermittent basis. They provide a variety of non-hospital settings such as your extended care facilities, ambulatory or home health care agencies. Next, we're going to talk about our categories of healthcare. So, categories of healthcare can come in primary, secondary, and tertiary. Um, because the boundaries of healthcare have become fluid, it's useful to look at the systems in different light. So, the complexity of care is no longer a predictor of where the patient will receive the care or where the care will be delivered. Instead, we have regulators, finances, um, and client support systems that dictate where a client will be um, located in the system. So when we talk about our primary care services, primary care focuses on, on health promotion and disease prevention. So what do we think could fit into that, right? If we're doing health promotion, um, that's gonna be your education, um, getting your screenings and things like that. We can have an individual, so counseling to a pregnant patient about prenatal stuff. It could be a group teaching about nutrition, um, a community advocating for um, billboards that you know show the best foods. It can be societal for international partners to establish worldwide prenatal nutrition status. When we move on to secondary, secondary services are directed towards early diagnosis and treatment of illness, disease, and injury, right? So if we're doing that, um, the nurse is going to provide direct care. Um, we're going to want to restore health. Um, we're going to trend away from hospitalization, but um, we want to address the physical, mental, spiritual, and social dimensions in the patient care. Our tertiary services refers to your long-term um, services or care for the dying. Historically, these services were provided in the extended care facility. Now, however, many are tertiary care. Next, we're gonna be moving on to our interprofessional healthcare team model. So again, if you're familiar with hospitals, this is really nothing that you know, you're know you unfamiliar with, um, but if you're new to this world, it's a lot. So physicians, physicians are gonna be your MDs, which are gonna be a medical doctor, or they're gonna be your DOs, which are doctors of osteopathy. Um, they're equivalent as far as licensure is concerned. Their role is to diagnose and treat disease and illness through the medical and surgical services. Um, physicians who provide only hospital care are known as hospitalists. And this is a growing specialty as hospital endeavors um, to reduce cause, cost. More physicians are choosing employment in a hospital rather than a private 
a practice because it guarantees them a salary, it gives them benefit packages, and it gives them limited hours. So if you're thinking of um, the medical world food chain, the physicians are going to be at the top of the food chain. The next is going to be the nurse practitioner. So the nurse practitioners are licensed, and they're going to be independent practitioners with advanced education and training to provide medical and nursing care to clients based on their specialty area. Nurse practitioners engage in activities ranging from health promotion to caring for clients with acute and chronic health care problems. Next, we have our physician's assistants. So physician assistants can diagnose and treat certain diseases and injuries. However, they must practice under the supervision of a physician. Each state varies with regard to the scope and practice of both nurses, nurse practitioners and PAs. So um, they need to be aware of the state they practice and the um, laws that permit how they work. Um, up north, I've never worked with PAs um, because being that they needed to be supervised by a physician, our physicians did not want to take that legal liability of having somebody treat patients technically under them, right? So every chart that a PA had, a physician had to co-sign, whereas an advanced practice nurse practices independently um, depending on the state. So we use those more often. Um, down here, I have in Tennessee, I came across a lot of PAs. Um, so it's just different states, different um, ways of doing things. So, you know, you just need to be aware of changes depending on where you're going. Registered nurses, right? We use the treatment plan outlined by the medical provider to develop and implement our holistic, continuous, and comprehensive nursing care. RNs are going to administer treatments and medications, but we're also going to provide education, and we're going to modify our nursing care plan based on our client's response to treatment. Your LPNs are going to implement client care under the supervision of a nurse. They can administer certain medications, provide non-complex care, and they can communicate to client information. They can do um, continuing assessments, but they can't do initial assessments. They can do continuing education, but they can't do initial education. So there are certain rules that as a nurse, you're gonna to need to learn so that you can delegate. And we'll get into that as we continue on. We also have our unlicensed, um, assist personnel. So you might see this as a nurse's aide, nurse's assistant, technician. Um, these are people that are going to be providing care for patients directly under the supervision of a nurse or a physician, and it's going to vary depending on this setting. Um, and then we have our therapist, and your book has a slew of different therapists. So, um, oh, I skipped pharmacist. So there's pharmacists. Pharmacists are going to be the ones that prepare and dispense medications. Um, they're going to give therapeutic solutions in hospitals, communities, pharmacies, and various health settings. They also collaborate with nurses, physicians, and other healthcare team members to ensure the selection of a safe and effective medication to be included in the treatment. They provide information about medication contraindications, side effects, adverse reactions, dosages, and administration tips. So if you're ever on the floor and you have a medication order and you're kind of unsure about it, rather than asking the nurse next to you, who might also be unsure, you can ask the pharmacist because that's their area of expertise. Now we're going to talk about the therapy. So your book has, like I said, um, a ton of different therapists in it. Um, we have occupational therapy. Occupational therapy, I always think, is the one that's going to help get your patient's dexterity back, right? So that they can write with a pen or they can tie their shoes, um, things that they need to do a job. Physical therapy is going to help them get their range of motion and they're going to get their strength back. We can have respiratory therapy, which if you work in a hospital, respiratory therapist is great friends to have because if patients ever having a hard time breathing, the respiratory therapy is the person that you're going to want to call. And um, we might want to call it rapid response, but they're on the rapid response team. Um, you can have um, different types of speech therapy, 
speech therapy is going to help with your patient with speeching. If they're after a stroke, they might also help with their swallow um, and they'll evaluate that for you. So um, definitely read through all of that. Financing healthcare. So healthcare is not free. We as nurses, for the most part, provide our nursing care, no matter what the patient can pay or not pay, um, especially if it's in a hospital setting, right? Um, we have all of those laws that um, no longer allows hospitals to um, transfer patients just because they don't have the ability to pay. However, it is important to understand how your patients are paying because sometimes you'll run into people that are not seeking care or that are trying to leave the emergency room or don't want to go to the OR because of their financial situation. So, um, and if that is the case, you can have them talk to uh, case management or whoever your organization has as that um, liaison to get things covered or worked out for them so that they can get appropriate health care. Um, that's not typically in the nurse's good practice as far as dealing with the billing, but definitely it is in your scope of practice to make sure that they get the optimal care. And if they need you to help them with the resources to talk to that financial liaison, then you know we want to make that happen. So we have individual payments. Individual payments are going to be out-of-pocket payments, so paying with a credit card or paying with cash. You can have individual private insurance, which is very expensive. Um, however, we're seeing more of this now. Um, the insurance company will contract the healthcare providers to deliver care to the insured member at a pre-arranged rates. Um, I know a lot of uh, physicians who do um, like almost like a PRN physician role, they'll do individualized private insurance. Um, people who have their own business, maybe if their business is too small, um, but they make more money than government aid will allow them to have, they'll have to do individual private insurance employment-based private insurance would be what you get if you have a job that provides you insurance. But sometimes these employment-based private insurances um, do not allow patients to have optimal coverage. Uh, businesses, excuse me, um, businesses pick out the most I want to say the cheapest plan because there's no way that I can speak for everybody on that, but they're going to have to pick something that they can afford um, and that their employees can afford. And um, employees are slowly attempting to limit their cost of doing business by reducing the amount of coverage that they can provide to their um, employees. So a lot of times you'll have somebody come in and you'll be like, oh, well, you have private insurance. It should be no issue. But sometimes those private insurances say that, you know, they have to pay $10,000 out of pocket before the insurance company will actually start to cover the costs. And $10,000 is a lot for patients. So again, um, just food for thought. We have government Medicare. Um, Medicare is a federal insurance program. Um, it was created in 1965 um, for patients that were 65 years and older. In 1972, the program was expanded to include younger people without permanent disabilities, such as end-stage renal disease. Medicare financing comes from payroll tax levied on employers and employees. Um, and then Medicaid is funded through the state and federal taxes. Most states have um, managed care organizations such as HMOs who contract with providers for healthcare services. You can have charitable organizations um, like Salvation Army, Red Cross, and they can provide those resources like for the homeless, the mentally ill, and victims of violence. Um, there's also CHIPS, which is the children's insurance company. 
But CHIPS is going to be for kids whose families fall into that poverty um, so that they can still get health insurance. The impact of healthcare reform, healthcare reform. So um, slowly and slowly, the healthcare providers that reimburse the hospitals the money um, started um, making it more difficult to get money back. Um, hospitals are reimbursed on a per case flat rate basis determined by um, the groups having similar need. These groups are called diagnostic related groups. If the client's hospital costs were set greater than that reimbursed set amounts, the hospital loses money. So what that's saying is that if, if the insurer says all MIs get $20,000 reimbursement and the hospital says we treated the patient and it costs us $30,000, the hospital has to swallow that extra $10,000. If the costs were less than the rate set by Medicare, the hospital can make a profit. So if you agreed that all patients with MIs get $20,000, but then you're able to find ways to treat them for $10,000, then the hospital is going to make an extra 10 grand. Um, and this is with your private insurances, your Medicare, the reimbursement in the same manner. With this, they've also started saying that if you give your patient an infection, um, a hospital inquired infection, you don't get any reimbursement for anything that comes from that. Um, if you don't meet certain standards, you're not going to get certain medications. So there's a lot that goes in through reimbursement, which is why your hospitals that you work for are going to constantly have all of these checklists and these educations on how to chart and all of that's just to make sure that they get optimal reimbursement. So who manages care, right? We have our health maintenance organizations, which are HMOs, um, and these models of care based on capita, which is per head cost. Each HMO primary care provider receives predetermined fixed amount each month, regardless of whether the patient receives healthcare services or not. So the primary provider coordinates all the care, including um, referral specialists. So, if you have a um, insurance that is an HMO, your doctor, who you claim is your primary care, is going to get money for you even if you're there or not there. Then we have our preferred provider organizations. Um, this offers patients more flexibility than HMOs, such as seeing specialists within the network without having to get a referral from a primary care physician, we're seeing out-of-network providers um, at a higher cost than in-network providers. And hearing those two things, you can see why some doctors will only accept patients that have an HMO versus accepting patients that have PPOs. Because if I have an office and I can only have, let's say, I know that I can only manage a maximum of 200 patients, and I have 200 patients that all have HMOs, then every month, regardless of whether I treat them or not, I'm gonna get paid. But if I say I only have 200 patients and they're all PPOs, well, if they never come to see me, I'm never gonna get the money. So it makes sense why you know, these providers you know, choose how they want to handle things. You can also have point of care service, which is combination um, that features from the HMO and the PPO. The patient selects a physician from the list of network physicians who will become their point of service provider for treatment and referrals to in-network specialties. The patient needs to see in-network providers in order to get a lower copay and minimal to no deductions. Um, there's limited out-of-network coverage resulted in higher co-insurance and co-pay. And then we have integrated delivery systems, which combines providers, health facilities, pharmaceuticals, and services into one care system. Providers are employees of the facilities. Um, they see only people from that integrated delivery system. And I've actually worked for companies that do this. 
it's very nice that all of your medical insurance is covered. Um, the negativeness is if the facility that you work for is not the number one in neurology and you need a neurologist who's outside of the system, you're not able to go to it without paying out of pocket. So now we talk about healthcare reform issues. So starting with the uh, ANA, uh, their recommendations are to redesign healthcare system to provide universal access to essential healthcare services for all citizens and residents, to establish health policies that support safe, effective, client centered, timely, efficient, and fair care based on outcomes research. We want to shift the priority from illness care to health promotion and balance between high-tech treatment and community-based and preventative services, establishing a single payer system for financing healthcare. Then we have a work redesign, which involves looking at the level of care required and the mixed personal necessary to achieve the best client outcomes. Out of this redesign, a concept known as the critical pathway emerged. A critical pathway is a multidisciplinary approach to care that sequences interventions over length of stay for a given case type. So a lot of the local hospitals use critical pathways, as this says, for case type. So if you have a patient who comes in for congestive heart failure, they'll go into the congestive heart failure critical pathway. And the critical pathway for congestive heart failure says the patient may stay for X days of service. During these X days of service, you need to provide you know, A, B, and C medical care. And if you do not hit all of that, then you do not get your reimbursement. You have case management, which is another work redesign that is to coordinate the care across the healthcare system. Many hospitals, home health agencies, and insurance company employ nurses as case managers to ensure that clients receive care is efficient quality care using the most cost-effective resources. Um, nurses that I know that do case management from home some of them do them for the insurance companies, and some of them do them for the facilities. And the facilities nurse case manager is going to try to get the patient everything they can. And the insurance case manager is going to try to get them the most with the least financial burden. Um, and it's always interesting when I talk to either side because they'll always be complaining about the other ones. Not that they know one another by any means, but just in general, um, I have friends that work on both sides, so it's interesting. Um, and then there's always the question, is healthcare a right or is healthcare a privilege? And then that's just food for thought. So ensuring quality care, how do we do this? We wanna do continuous quality improvements. So you can have those CQI programs. Um, some hospitals have very robust quality improvement measures and some hospitals do not. Um, in 1975, the ANA developed a model for QI, um, then called Quality Assurance, a QA. Um, this model is useful to understanding the continuous quality improvement process. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get there. So our societal trends that influence our nursing practice, the economy, the economy is huge. In the United States, health insurance coverage is linked to full-time employment with health insurance benefits. Um, although this may be changing with our recent federal legislation, um, unemployment figures rise, so do the number of people without insurance. Many uninsurance people delay seeking medical treatment. This leads to patients that are sicker when they actually enter into the healthcare system. They're not going to be having those disease prevention. They're not going to be having those health wellness promotions. 
Um, and with that, the consumer also influences it, right? Patients have access to vast amounts of healthcare and medical information, particularly through the internet, right? We have our WebMDs, um, we have our leapfrog scores that say how good the hospital is. Um, in this area, Knoxville particularly, there was a ton of hospitals and you know you could work at a hospital that has a great consumer rating um, and be very well off or you can have a hospital that has poor consumer ratings and patients don't want to go to you and if they do end up there sometimes they're already a little unhappy we have legislation um, Right, so consumer interest has also generated legislation that affects your nursing care. Legislation direct at confidentiality of patient records, treating patients who need emergency care, the patient's right to know, so informed consent, and the patient's right to um, develop their living will and advanced directives. All of that govern how we, the nurse, render care to our patients. Um, the women's movement, so historically, only unmarried women were allowed to practice nursing. As the women's movement gained momentum, women were no longer forced out of nursing if they chose to have family, whereas women's careers were traditionally limited to teaching, clerical work, and nursing. The women's movement opened up more choices. As a result, nursing has become just one of the many options for a career, and it's no longer the only career pathway. Also, as you've seen, societal views of nursing as women of profession has influenced decision of men to enter. Um, this, what was historically a do not enter field for men. So trends in the nursing practice, um, you know, we have our increase of complementary alternative medication. And we'll talk about that. I believe that's our last chapter four to six. Um, we talk about that stuff. Um, we have increased variety of care locations. So historically, nurses have graduated nursing school and they've been told to spend one to two years in med surge and then go to specialty locations. Now with the high demand of, of nursing needs, nursing students are graduated and they're going to areas like cath lab and trauma bays, um, which is all very exciting. Um, and it's interesting to see all the variety of locations they can work at. Interprofessional collaboration is something that we are going to talk extensively about. This is your way of working with physical therapy, occupational therapy, with you know PAs and nurses and physicians and the lab and all professionals who take care of the patients and maintaining those professional um, roles and communications. We have expanded career roles for nurses. So, you know, you can start as an associate degree nurse and expand into a nurse practitioner, or you can expand into informatics and all the computer technologies, or you could expand into home health. Like those expanded career roles are endless. We have increased use of nursing assisted personnel. Um, some states allow, you know, um, med pass to be done by people who just take a special certification to be allowed to do it. Some states allow some medics and medics can work in the hospital and they can do IVs. So we're definitely using um, assistive personnel more now than we have before. We have influence nursing on health policy. And um, we have our high tech, high touch. So this is just more food for thought for you. And that's the end of this lecture, which was extremely long, but I hope you hung in there and enjoyed. Thank you.